everybody here? Even online? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. To the Lord, we beseech you all our actions by your holy inspirations. We carry them on by your gracious assistance, so that your prayer and work of ours may always begin from you, and through you be happily ended, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady, Mother of the Church, St. Joseph, St. Francis and St. Clair, St. Katerita Pray for us. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Paul speaks about the incarnation in his own unique way. When the fullness of time had come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. You are no longer a slave, but a child. If a child, then also an heir, true God. Quite graphic, isn't it? Please to uh, speak about justification by faith or build on that. And how uh, faith works through love love in our lives. If we want to understand Ignatius Loyola, we can say that for him, prayer is a conversation. I think we picked that up this morning. The underlying dynamic of Ignatian prayer is that of a meeting relationship with God that involves give and take, a response to his invitation and sharing of his life. The spiritual exercises urge us to see ourselves as God sees us. In the words of Paul, his sons and daughters, members of his family. Jesus used the affectionate word Abba to refer to his father when he prayed. We can address God in the same intimate way because we are God's children. Prayer is a natural outcome of this close relationship of a parent and a child. Prayer is a conversation. The central activity of prayer is, springs naturally from our humanity. It's a matter of conversing with a very good friend. Some people are better at it than others. I'm not a great conversationalist. I can engage in conversations, I can respond. But I often find that I, uh, rather than give leading questions, letting people speak, I kind of ask questions that get yes or no answers. I guess, guess I'm a teacher. Got that right? Yes, yes or no <laughs> My brother knows the opposite. He can talk to anybody about anything. Of course, he's a salesman. And that probably got some going, but he uh, he meets all kinds of people and knows more things about them more quickly than, than I do. And I've met these people and known them for years. So each of us has our own way of, of being, right? From the beginning of his spiritual journey, Ignatius had a good idea of what he wanted to do. He wanted to be like Francis and Dominic. He wanted to evangelize, to bring good news of the incarnation to others. He wanted, above all, to lead others to a relationship with Christ Jesus. The striking thing for me is with his, uh, his own personal life, he didn't find Christ really as a moving force from his life until he was 30. When he met Francis Xavier and uh, Peter Faber, each of them was in their early 20s. Each was a Catholic, raised in the church, but Somehow the faith was notional and not effective, not lived. And he wanted to change, change that. And that's what he developed the exercises for, to engage people in conversations. How to accomplish this of bringing people to other Christ was less clear. It took years for him to develop the attitudes, the insights and the techniques that we know as Ignatian spirituality. He made many mistakes along the way and wandered down several blind alleys. He was familiar with the work of the Dominicans and an order of learned clerics who specialized in ministry preaching. Ignatius admired good preaching, but this was not the evangelistic tool that he was looking for. Ignatius was attracted to the Franciscans, gave a powerful witness to the gospel through their poverty. 
You do not think that their humble, itinerant way of life was the direction God wanted him to take. And so too with other groups. The Carthusians were very close to the Carthusians. Ignatius and his companions would spend Sunday afternoons in Paris while they were university students going to the Carthusian monastery. Peter Faber had an uncle who was a Carthusian. Whenever they go near a Carthusian place, they would uh, go there, spend time there. Ignatius said he could only imagine the Jesuits leaving the Jesuits for another way of life if they went to the Carthusians. I've never been tempted that way. <laughs> well, you know, each of us has our own approach. Some spiritual approaches seemed too passive to him. They were based on reading books and listening to sermons and lectures. Maybe that's what the Philip Mary was doing in Rome, giving talks all the time. Although there was a conversational dimension to Philip Mary as well. They appeared to say that God can be found through some kind of passive absorption of goodwill and good behavior. Nations rather had a more active way of looking at life. He understood that people were actively engaged with work in the world and they had dealings with each other. They shared life with each other. This act of sharing of grace and gifts and talents eventually became the how for Jesuit evangelistic ministry. Ignatius describes his ministry by the simple Spanish word conversar, which means to converse, to talk with. The simplest meaning in English is to sincere talk with another person, the kind of comfortable, satisfying conversation whereby we truly get to know someone else. When I was in Poitiers, uh, my friend, uh, Father Julien, uh, set up a meeting with me and his bishop, his archbishop. He said, just be careful. He's a very, very introverted person. And the Archbishop wasn't too happy that he was going to entertain the Archbishop Emeritus of Ottawa Gorba. And so we started the conversation, you know, negotiating a little bit here and there. But after a while, we fell into conversation. A good steak will do that, friend. You're talking over to a glass of wine. Ignatius seems to have had an extraordinary gift for friendship. He had lots of friends. We were talking in the program about all the women in his life and how they related to the Society of Jesus. I thought often of the uh, relationship that they had with him as being like the women that followed Jesus in chapter eight of Luke's gospel, providing for the middle of their means. They were wealthy people and they looked after them. I don't think it was cheap looking after Jesus and his 12 disciples or the companions of Jesus, Society of Jesus. The first Jesuits were a group of men who were initially bound together by their affection and love for Ignatius Loyola. Conversar has broader meanings as well. It means to be conversant with, to know someone or something. Truly know them deeply. It means to have dealings with. Converse with someone is to know them, to be involved with their lives. Ignatius' scheme of things to converse is one of our ways of loving. So Ignatius' spiritual life developed around this idea of conversation, based on conversation with God in prayer, developed through conversation with others, with spiritual directors, confessors, like-minded friends who share one's ideals and way of life, like the associates do here. And it's harder and harder to find spiritual directors and confessors these days. All three conversations are embodied in the spiritual exercises. Retreat is guided through the conversation with Extra by a conversation with a spiritual director who cultivates conversation with God. So the spiritual director listens to what the retreat is saying and says, well, maybe you should try this and talking to God. Or maybe this is what God is saying to you through these particular things that you experience. But does it take somebody from outside to help us see? The goal of the exercise is to help the person to get involved in more fruitful conversation with others in ministry. Ignatius developed them from his experience as a spiritual director of men and women seeking a deeper relationship with God. It was just ways to pray, scripture passages to meditate on, scenes to imagine, ideas to ponder. He always had his own little interpretation that he would add in. Together they could discern how God seemed to be leading them. Ignatius' book, perhaps one of the more influential spiritual books written about developing a relationship with God, is essentially a collection of home and conversation. 
not perfect, Neat and adapting all the time. And there's a whole series of websites uh, um, you can find on the internet which deal with interpreting, interpreting Ignatius and adapting the exercises in daily life. You can make the 30 day retreat over a year, appropriate every day, talk to people every week or two. This first exercise are structured around developing a relationship between the retreatant and Jesus Christ. Prayer is a natural outcome of a close relationship. It's not something mysterious or esoteric or something we learn how to do in school. It's a pray by, we learn to pray by doing prayer. If we can talk, we can pray. Of course, we can learn to pray better, just as we can learn to be a better conversationalist. I'm still working on being a conversationalist. Maybe by the time I'm 90, I'll be there. The essential activity of prayer springs naturally from our humanity, a matter of conversing with a very good friend. Consider what Jesus did when the disciples asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. Did these Jewish men who prayed five times a day really not know what it meant to pray? Hardly. But they want to know Jesus' way of praying because they noticed that there was something about the way he went about things when he prayed in the, out in the wilderness in the morning, in the mountaintop at night, perhaps before a meal, we don't know. So we talked to the Our Father, that played well Christian prayer. That way of prayer is more important than the words he taught. You're familiar with God, Our Father. You reverence him, one who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You share God's desires, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You ask for what we need, give us this day our daily bread, which is not just about bread, but about every relationship that we need to sustain us and keep us going. And we beg for our Father's protection, deliver us from evil, forgive us our trespasses. These elements of prayer cover the whole range of human conversation. Sharing experience, saying thank you, asking for help, crying out in pain, begging forgiveness, expressing love, and spending time together. It's what we do when we get together with our friends. We do the same when we get together with God. <coughs> prayer takes many forms, mystical prayer, devotional prayer, liturgical prayer, spiritual reading, moments of <coughs> epiphany, <coughs> snatch from our daily lives. All of it is in, understood by Ignatius' conversar. Ignatius would never have thought himself as a highly educated intellectual, though he did a degree from the University of Paris, the finest university at the time in Europe. Well acquainted with the leading ideas of philosophers and theologians, an excellent analytical thinker. But you often say to people during retreat and uh, <coughs> met them in spiritual direction, read a chapter of Garrison. Carson, what's that? Carson was a director of the University of Paris who wrote a little handbook <coughs> about prayer. And later on, that name got attached also to the Imitation of Christ, which we now know is run by Thomas Akempis. So whenever Ignatius says, read a chapter of Garrison, he means read, read Thomas Akempis' Imitation of Christ, which is pithy statements. No, not very heavy, not very, not very theological, but profound. The notes he took during his uh, time after his recovery from his wounds filled a 300 page notebook that he treasured for the rest of his life. He told himself, St. Dominic did this, therefore I must do it. St. Francis did this, therefore I must do it. <laughs> Ignatius then daydreamed about feats of nightly valor and romantic adventures. His died of daydreams alternating between the two. And of course, we know that when he compared his uh, reactions to reading about the lives of the saints versus reading, um, think, imagining about novels, which he didn't have, which he used in his imagination, he found that the imagining about doing chivalrous acts and wooing women and being at court and dancing and spending the night, have a great time, left to dry and empty after. But talking about Christ, <coughs> talking to Christ, learning about Christ, learning about the saints, 
Hidden Constellation. Ignatius presents two ways of imagining in the spiritual exercises. The first way is demonstrating the meditation on the mystery of the incarnation, which we just did this morning, the second week of the exercises. He asks us to enter into the vision of God. God is looking down at our turbulent world. We imagine God's concern for the world. We seek God intervening by sending Jesus to the maelstrom of life. We ask ourselves, what is God thinking? Can we talk to God about that? <coughs> this type of imagining helps us see things from God's perspective. It takes on God's qualities of love, compassion, understanding. The desire to save people from the path of going, which is to destruction and uh, to the lack of life. The second method of imagining is to place ourselves fully within a story from the Gospels. We become onlooker participants and give full reign to our imagination. Jesus is speaking to a blind man at the side of the road, and so we feel the hot Mediterranean sun beating down upon us. We smell the dust kicked up by the passers-by. We feel the itchy clothing we're wearing, the sweat rolling down our brow, a rumble of hunger. We see the desperation of the blind man's face and hear the wail of hope in his words. We know the irritation of the disciples. They want to keep moving. Above all, we watch Jesus, the way he walks, his gestures, the look in his eyes, the expression on his face. We hear him speak the words that are recorded in the Gospels, and we go on to imagine other words that he might have spoken, and other deeds he might have done. I would suggest to you, like this morning, that in our prayer at the Spirit, helps us understand Jesus by the words that we imagine him saying. You're not going to write them out and publish them as, this, as another gospel, but they can be fuel for your spiritual life, your devotion. The best known example of this is the imagination of this is the contemplation of Jesus' birth in the second week. Ignatius suggests that we imagine the labors of the journey, the struggles of finding a shelter, the poverty, the thirst, the hunger, the cold, the insults that meet our Savior who's coming to save the world, to save me. And all of this, and he mentions this at the very beginning of his exercises, in order that after such toils, after hunger, thirst, heat, cold, insults, and efforts, he may die on the cross. And all of this for me. And by reflecting to drive some spiritual profit. All this for me. When he comes to the passion, St. Nisha says, you should be aware that Christ could have used all kinds of power to overcome those who came to seize him. He called on angels, but he doesn't. He not know they must, I could call on a legion of angels to come, but I do not. This is your power, this is the time. It's for my sins to take them away out of love for me. So we watch Jesus the way he walks and his gestures and try to get into the picture ourselves. He chooses scenes of Jesus acting rather than Jesus teaching or telling parables. You know, we had that long stretch of the gospel a couple weeks ago, we were doing the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Mission Sunday Discourse. It's hard to really contemplate that what's going on jesus is talking okay one of my friends told me he was very struck one time when he was reading the sermon on the mount jesus went up sat down and opened his mouth he said open his mouth he spent the whole time praying just on jesus opening his mouth before he said it jesus wanted to communicate to us Stuff so tuck in, right? I was struck by <laughs> this favorite part, you know? Each of us that comes our own way, right? <laughs> Ignatius wants us to see Jesus interacting with others. Notice that's what he values in his own life, right? Interaction with people. Jesus making decisions, Jesus moving about, he's ministering. He doesn't want us to think about Jesus. He wants us to experience him. He wants Jesus to fill our senses. <laughs> he wants us to meet him. 
one of the things that CCO constantly does is deal with young people who grew up in the Catholic faith and then went to the university and left everything behind. And then they come to their senses through meeting somebody from CCO. They meet Jesus Christ for the, sometimes for the first time. They've had a notional knowledge of him, but now they have a effective personal knowledge of Jesus. Of course, it can be ephemeral. It can be just come and go, you know? It's like this experience of the week, but it can also be something very profound that changes them. Following Jesus is the business of our lives. To follow him, we must know him. We get to know him through our imagination, through prayer, not through theological reflection or scripture study, but through prayer on the scriptures, on theology, perhaps. It allows the person of Christ to penetrate the place that the intellect does not touch. It brings Jesus into our hearts. When I was uh, in Spain, one of the sisters who was there was a Sacred Heart sister from India. And she had gone to Guelph well for me the spiritual exercises. And she was great friends with John Govan, uh, who uh, really uh, is a suffering servant with the Lord. John was probably the best athlete we ever had at Loyola High School in Montreal, a basketball star, great swimmer, played football for the University of Guelph when he was a novice and a junior. Uh, he took up hockey late in life, was a great goaltender, was a brilliant student. Went off to do a doctor in California, came home one summer and there was problems with his uh, attention span. They diagnosed a brain cancer and they did surgery for him and it was not very well done. He had a lot of afflictions after that. So he spent the rest of his life doing spiritual ministry as a spiritual director in Guelph. Sometimes it was hard to understand what he was saying because it was slurred speech. Sometimes he couldn't hear. I saw him last week, he's really, very difficult pain, difficult suffering. But uh, the sister was struck by a thing that John said to her one time. He said, sometimes the biggest, the longest journey is from your head to your heart. A lot of us have head knowledge of Jesus, called that heart knowledge. And when I went to Guelph last week and made a trip by the retreat house, I discovered they had a bench there who said, the longest journey is from the head to the heart, John Govan SJ. Mm -hmm. So I guess he must have said it often enough that when, the, when he left there, they, they put that on the bench. But I think there's something for us to think about. You know? uh, we, we religious and uh, serious uh, spiritual people uh, can be a lot of times in our heads. I'm not against being in your head. I mean, I'm a, I'm a scripture scholar, I read scripture books. But we have to move beyond scripture to scripture scholarship to actualization of the word of God and the prayer and the exercises. Imagine that prayer makes the Jesus of the gospel our Jesus. It helps us develop a unique and personal relationship with him. We watch Jesus' face, we listen to the way he speaks, we notice how people respond to him. These imaginative details bring us to know Jesus more than a name or historical figure in a book. He's a living person. He's the risen one. We say after our prayer that what the villagers in John's gospel told the Samaritan woman, we have come to know him ourselves and not just from your report. Our engagement with him, we've come to know him ourselves personally. What should we do on prayer, prayer this afternoon or tonight or whatever, tomorrow morning? Well, the normal preparatory prayer is to be aware of God's presence and to pause before we start and ask that all that we say and do may be for God's grace and great glory. Then I suggest that you take a text from the infancy narratives, Bethlehem, Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 20, or Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. <clears throat> Uh, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, or the trip into Egypt, Matthew 2, 13 to 17, and the return, 19 to 23, or two other stories that are found in Nazareth, uh, in Luke's gospel, the story of the presentation of the temple and the child going back to them in, in, in uh, Nazareth, and then the story of the finding of the temple, or the lost and finding of the temple. Chapter 2, 41 to 52, so 21 to 40, 41 to 
Thank you. Ignatius also has a text, uh, a proposal that we meditate on the hidden life. It's that last verse there of uh, Luke chapter 1, uh, chapter 2, 1 to 20, or chapter verse 40. He went to Nazareth, was subject to them who in wisdom, age, and grace. What did he do? See him acting, see him interacting. You know about the trip to, to Jerusalem as well, but in between time, what was it like? I remember the movie, I think it was about Mary, you know, a couple of years ago where we had a family teaching him, not Mary, but grandparents. Great imagination by who would have put the movie together, but it was, you know, fills in. I'm always uh, intrigued when I see people writing novels about Jesus, his childhood and what went on. Some I can say, yes, I, that makes sense. Other times I say, that's a little bit off, off the mark, but that's my view, you know? So the preludes would be to see the scene, hear the people talking, see what they're doing. Scene, conversation, the action. Nation, right? They should like to see what we're saying, what we're doing. And the grace I ask is to know Christ better, to love him more, follow him more closely, whatever way whatever I want to put that. But your choice as to what the passage would be, but enter into the scene, let the Lord touch you, let, you know, touch the Lord yourself, touch his mother. And finally, a colloquy at the end uh, with our Blessed Mother or with Jesus or with the Father. With your saints. You know, St. Francis was the one who developed the crib. You know, ask him why he did that, what it was like. Probably know the story, I guess, from your own Franciscan tradition. Um, Gubbio, was it? Had you been there? No, I haven't been there myself, but I'm pretty sure they have You know, every Italian church has a crib at Christmas time that reflects the view of the pastor or the one who makes up the crib. We had a wonderful Italian oblate who was in the Holy Angels Parish in Toronto. Every year was a, a spectacular production. Went on for six weeks before Christmas. Stayed up for three weeks after. Uh, you know, one year it was, you know, Christ was the pearl in the oyster. Interesting. And they always have the baker and the butcher and the bikers, all those people. And, you know, everybody makes up the village. The, the, Gospel comes to, to, to humanity. I think a friend, I think Francis had a great idea about that. Anyway, uh, those are some things I, I've suggested you to think about and pray about. More experience than reflect, but you know, reading will help you. And during the day, uh, read parts of the infancy narratives, chapters one and two, and three in Matthew up to the baptism and the same thing in Luke's gospel, one, two, three. Three is really about the baptism and the genealogy and so on. In, in Luke and, and the genealogies in chapter one of Matthew. The interesting thing about the genealogy in Matthew, of course, it's got all these strange women who come in. Mm -hmm. Tamar and Rahab and Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. Does he give her name Bathsheba? We know it's her name. And Mary. Shady women, and the Blessed Mother's part of them. What's he saying, you know? People give wild interpretations of that, but anyway, it's, it's, it's there. There are also Gentiles. So the Savior is coming for not just the people of descendants of Abraham, but also the Gentiles. And of course, in Luke's Gospel, the genealogy goes back to Adam. Adam, son of, son of Adam, son of God. So I leave you with some thoughts for today and uh, during the uh, mass tonight, we're going to encounter God at the burning bush. We want to draw near and we have to keep away. You know, draw too close, don't come too close. God is awe-inspiring and so is this mystery that was facing awe-inspiring. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known, 
In the name of the Lord, flag protection, you pour the help from South Anchor Sessions. Slept on it. Inspired by this conference, I fly unto thee, O virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee I come before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O mother, the word incarnate, despise not my petitions. Bend thy mercy, hear and answer me. Amen. In the Father and Son, Amen. Thank you.